the traditional psychological thriller is called The Loot. Like many other traditional psychological thrillers, it has a prologue. There's a car traveling down the road at night. The road is in the middle of nowhere. There's a man and a woman sitting in the car. The man suggests that she should have sent a lawyer. She says, no, my purpose is to claim my inheritance. Hotel. They want to spend the night in this motel. It's, it's like an out of the way a roadside motel. The woman goes into the shower. The man goes into the lobby to purchase some canned food. In the lobby, he is attacked, bound and gagged. The next scene, uh, we are in the middle of a desert. It's dark. The attacker, whose face is not shown, is digging a hole. The man is in the car. The attacker drags the man out of the car, puts him in a hole, shoots him twice. Now back at the motel, the woman is attacked in the shower. Again, the attacker's face is not shown. And the attacker does not speak either. The attacker has a gun, which is pointed at the woman's face. Then a gloved hand co covers the woman's mouth. Following the attacker's silent orders, the woman gets dressed. And then her mouth is taped over and the attacker's hand is shown, writing with a sharpie, writing over the tape, plan B. The next scene is the opening scene of the actual story in which all of the Rafter kids are introduced. When it comes to money issues, Augustus Rafter is not prone to panic. If he loses money, he doesn't shout at the elements. Blow wings and crack your cheeks! Or, uh, Suck my dick, every one of you bastards. He takes everything in stride. A great portion of his multi-million dollar fortune comes from shady sources. So was he ever caught? Was he ever arrested? Put on trial? Stuck in jail? No. He was, up until a year ago, an upstanding very well respected member of the community. He owns this company, he has the control package of this company called Rafter Technologies. All of a sudden, he starts selling pieces of his company, turning them into cash, and giving this cash to charity. Hospitals, libraries, churches, soup kitchens. And when he starts doing that, he also moves to like the middle of nowhere. He buys a hunting lodge. There is a small town about four miles away. Now, and after a year of this life at the hunting lodge, as he continues giving away pieces of his company, all of a sudden, Mr. Augustus Rafter dies in a barn fire. All his children are notified and asked to come over. He has eight kids, four men and four women. All of them have different mothers, separate mothers. And yet, all of them are legitimate. In other words, he was married to the woman when he was having a child with her, then he divorced her, married the next one. So all the children are notified. They're not just notified, they're told specifically by Mr. Rafter's lawyer. You have to come in person to claim your share of the inheritance. Mr. Rafter left a will. It's locked away in a safe. It cannot be opened until the day after tomorrow. When they come, they cannot bring their children or their mothers. Life partners, husbands and wives are okay. When they arrive, they realize there are more conditions. In order for them to claim the inheritance, they have to uh, attend the funeral service, attend the funeral. Then they have to spend the rest of the day and the night at the hunting lodge, their fathers. The following morning, they have to show up at Mr. Guerrero's office. If they leave the lodge, for any reason at all, they forfeit their share of the inheritance. Of the eight children, six show up. Now, these six are our protagonist, Yolanda Rafter. Hi. She is the eldest sister, and she's different from all the other guys because she was a favorite child. She was shielded from the rest of them. She was never present at family gatherings. Augustus Rafter, her father, bought her a couple of houses here and there, a couple of apartments, and uh, spent a lot of quality time with her throughout her life. Some of them have never seen her. Some of them saw her maybe like 30 years ago. Then they all know each other and they bicker, they fight, but they do know each other. They treat one another like siblings. She is sort of an outsider. She is a klutz. She is always dropping shit, uh, you know, vases, 
glasses, bottles, plates, everything. And she has this very slight, barely noticeable uh, speech impediment. There's, there's a merest hint of a lisp there to, to compensate for it. She speaks slowly and sometimes monotonously. No, I don't. Yeah, you do. Julius Rafter is a doctor of psychology. He is accompanied by his wife, Agrippina. Everybody calls her Pines. Tiberius Rafter wanted to be a heavyweight champion of the world, but some things got in the way. Gambling, three very unruly wives, alimony. Marcus Rafter was in the military. He is now uh, a car salesman somewhere in Chicago. Now these two are the uh, idiots of the family. Everybody laughs at them and they don't like each other either because at some point they slept with each other's wives and are now both divorced and each time they meet they fight. Rowan Rafter owns a ranch. Her companion is called Titian. Francesca, whom everybody calls Fran, is a theater actress uh, whose career went to the dogs after she married the wrong manager. She is still married to him and he is also present here. His name is Hector. Now all these rafters gather in the office of Mr. Guerrero. Jack, one of the two people, one of the two kids that are missing, is represented by a lawyer. Mr. Guerrero, the lawyer for the family, explains to Jack's lawyer that, oops, Jack is not getting anything because he had to be here himself. No, your presence doesn't count. Uh, the lawyer now uh, thinks about it. I'll stay, I'll see what's going on, how it plays out tomorrow morning. Now all these Rafter kids, they have their father's genes. When they learn that there are conditions and they're not getting any money right away, and some of them even suspect that dear father left everything to the favorite child and left us nothing, they don't panic. We'll see how it plays out tomorrow. If worse comes to worse, we'll sue. They do as they're told. They drive to the hunting lodge. Titian, Rowan's lover, takes out his cell phone and starts trying to get a signal and there is no signal. And the lawyer explains to everybody that there was a tornado a few days ago, as a matter of fact, on the night when your father died. And it took out the tower. Now, the rafters are so focused on other things right now that it doesn't even occur to them to question it. Like, did the tornado really take out the tower? Was there a tornado to begin with? And now, Yolanda, the protagonist, the eldest sister, the favorite child, makes a speech in front of everybody in the living room. She says that she's independently wealthy and uh, she doesn't really know any of them, which is a pity. She would like to. And as a gesture of goodwill, she promises that if indeed, when they open the will, they discover that everything is given to her, she gets everything, she will share it equally among everyone, everybody else. And suddenly everybody else is like warming up to her. The funeral parlor turns out to be inside the lodge. It's a room dressed up as a funeral parlor. There is a closed casket. One of the rafters dares to open it. Their father's face is covered by a thick layer of uh, clown makeup with a plastic nose and a plastic lips and uh, two large silver dollars covering the eyes. The old woman, whom no one has seen before, walks in and starts playing the organ and she's followed in by a Tibetan monk. An hour later there's the burial at a cemetery uh, about a mile away. Then they all return to the lodge. Yolanda goes into her guest room, opens a suitcase, takes out a 9mm pistol and a roll of duct tape and tapes the pistol to the inside wall in the wall closet. And two women start making lunch for everybody in the uh, kitchen. Uh, Yolanda, the protagonist, the favorite child, and Pines, Julius's wife. They have this rapport, they, they click. While making lunch, Pines explains to Yolanda why, in her opinion anyway, those two members of the family are missing, Jack and Janice. Now Janice is a rich woman, she's got plenty of money of her own, she's also married to a billionaire. She doesn't need any of this crap and she doesn't like her siblings to begin with. Now Jack is a different story. Jack is the youngest child. Back when Jack was in high school, he fell in love and had uh, sexual relations with the chemistry teacher. Somebody ratted them out. So a lot of people got very excited. The administration, uh, the media, the authorities, and the uh, child abuse agencies. Augustus Rafter, the patriarch, 
He wanted all of this to go away, pay off whoever, cover the damn thing up. As it turned out, however, Little Jack had his own opinion of the matter. Dad, I happen to love that woman and I am going to marry her. Now this was disobedience and Little Jack had to be taught a lesson. And so Augustus Rafter paid off an entirely different set of people and the poor corpulent chemistry teacher was arrested and put on trial and some of the Rafter siblings figured as witnesses. The poor woman had the flu, she could barely speak at her own trial. She was found guilty of rape and sent to prison. <laughs> Little Jack finished high school and went away and no one has seen him since. Now in the next scene there's the, the, the country road connecting the lodge with the town and the Tibetan monk is walking down this road and uh, riding in the opposite direction is a cyclist in a helmet with a visor. They pass each other and then the, the, the cyclist comes from behind him, brains the monk with a baseball bat and then drags him into the nearby woods and ties him to a tree takes the, uh, the recording devices off him and his credentials. The monk turns out to be a federal agent. And the monk says, you can't just like leave me here, can you? I mean, I mean, seriously, I'm a federal agent. To which the cyclist says, it's okay, you know, you guys are like uh, energizer bunnies with an off switch. You know, tomorrow I'll come back and I'll throw the switch on. And the monk goes, you're gonna leave me here till tomorrow? There may be coyotes in this region. And the cyclist says, uh, don't worry about them, I talked to them. In the meantime, Marcus and Tiberius are fighting in the game room, destroying furniture in the process. While this is going on, Fran the actress, the thespian, takes a walk down this path nearby, next to the stream, and in the bushes she discovers uh, the body of the old woman who played the organ in the funeral parlor. She hesitates for a moment and then she decides not to say anything to anybody. Now just outside the lodge, Yolanda steps out to have a cigarette, then Julius steps out too, and then he goes, uh, well, my, my wife's taken a nap, so I had to turn to my thoughts as a source of entertainment, and I'm pretty upset now. As it turns out, I can't even remember the basics, uh, the basic things that makes a civilized person, well, a civilized person, like... Uh, the amount of coal that they produce in Wisconsin annually, the distance to Mars, or even the formula of vodka. And as he says formula of vodka, Yolanda like automatically shoots back. CH3CH2OH. And then she adds that that's all I remember from my chemistry lessons. When everybody's having lunch, Jack's lawyer says that somebody broke into his car and took out his briefcase. A little later, Tiberius and Marcus make up, have a drink, shoot some pool, and then they hear a scream. So together they rush out of the game room, home in on a signal whichever room the scream came from, burst into that room, and it's dark in there. They grab somebody, whoever was in that room, and uh, give that person a shine and then turn on the lights. It turns out that that person is Julius, their brother, the psychiatrist. Fucking idiots. They rush into the adjacent room. In the adjacent room lies the corpse of Titian, Rowan's lover. And Rowan is next to him on her, on her knees. Now the rest of the rafters and their companions file into the room. Then they all go back downstairs to the living room and uh, grab the phone, the landline. Now, while everybody is waiting for the police to arrive, Yolanda, the protagonist taking the initiative, says that in all likelihood, there is no raving homicidal maniac roaming the grounds. It was a mob hit. Titian was in a witness protection program. Am I right, Roanne? Whoever came after him has already done his deed. Everybody's safe. Now Rowan feels sick. Tiberius offers to take her to his room and let her like lie in bed there and rest. Now this very young sheriff arrives and uh, questions everybody. He's very young and he's very resentful of uh, people who are well off. The sheriff goes upstairs with everybody else to see the body and the body's gone. Every hunting lodge must have a gun room. Where is the gun room? There is a gun room. Nobody paid attention to it really, but the, in, in the room that uh, posed as the funeral parlor, there is another door. It's barely noticeable. And then you go down the steps and there's the gun room in the semi-basement. There's like windows, narrow windows under the ceiling. 
And in this gun room, which is periodically shown throughout the story, there are initially two people. Uh, there's an old man gagged and tied to a chair with a, with a tall back so that his head is also taped to the chair so he cannot move his head. And there's the woman from the prologue. She is bound and gagged. Now periodically bodies are added to this room. The first one obviously being Titian. Yolanda says she needs to use the bathroom in her room. Now to that sheriff says that okay everybody's going downstairs. You, Yolanda, lock yourself in your room and don't come out, don't open the door until you hear my voice. When everybody is downstairs, the sheriff goes into Yolanda's room and they have sex. They seem to have known each other for a while. Marcus and Tiberius knock on Yolanda's door. The sheriff hides in the bathroom. And Marcus, Tiberius and Yolanda go to check on Rowan and find that she is dead. She's been poisoned. Hector, Franz's husband, shares some of his theories with the sheriff. There are two hypotheses. One is Jack's lawyer, who by the way is missing is not really Jack's lawyer, he's a paid assassin hired by Jack to take revenge on the entire family. The other hypothesis is that Rafter Technologies has hired an assassin as a matter of damage control. Both these theories would imply that Augustus Rafter's death was no accident. The sheriff tries to contact the authorities, but the landline is suddenly dead. Now the sheriff goes outside to use the police radio in his car. Everybody else follows him out and then they discover A, uh, the radio's gone and B, all the cars out there have flat tires, all of them. <laughs> Fran, as she comes out on the porch, sprains her ankle. Ouch, fuck. Marcus, who uses uh, run flat tires, offers to give everybody a ride to town. There is a working telephone in Mr. Guerrero's office. So Marcus walks to his Jeep, which is parked at some distance from the rest of the cars because Marcus is a very special person. And like halfway to the Jeep, he stops, turns around, comes back and says, hey, there's somebody sitting in my Jeep watching us. Now as Marcus and Tiberius distract whoever it is sitting in Marcus's Jeep with a flashlight and a bullhorn. Get, Get out, out of, of the, the vehicle. vehicle. The sheriff circles around, comes, comes back from behind to the Jeep, opens the driver's side door and uh, Jack's lawyer's corpse falls out of the Jeep. So the sheriff motions everybody to come over and everybody does except for Fran who hobbles back into the house and Hector follows. So everybody gathers around the jeep and Marcus says listen guys yeah listen guys you get Fran out of the house I'll pull up to the porch so as they walk away from the jeep he opens up the hatch and takes out a shotgun and a 9 millimeter. and he's perfectly happy now he's in his own element now as the rest of them approach the porch some of them turn around and, and then they see the explosion now Yolanda goes into her room and discovers that the pistol that she had taped to the inside wall of the wall closet is now missing. Pines comes into the room and says that she's scared. And Yolanda says, don't worry about it. She opens up her suit bag and takes out a revolver. In the meantime, downstairs in the living room, Hector has yet another theory. He says this Yolanda person, no one has seen her in 30 years. Maybe she is not who she says she is. Maybe she's an agent for Rafter Technologies or for Jack. At this point, Julius remembers his conversation with Yolanda and the fact that she remembered the formula of vodka. Maybe she's a chemistry teacher. Hector talks Fran into leaving. Let's just, you know, get into the car and drive as far as it can get us on flat tires. Julius goes upstairs to look for Pines and can't find her. Pines? Pines? And now suddenly everybody hears a pistol shot. At this point, Yolanda goes back into her room and sees Pines and sees Julius on the floor dying and the window is open. And Pines explains that somebody rushed in, did this and jumped out the window and she couldn't see her face. As Hector and Fran drive in the rain, in the dark, down this countryside road, the Tibetan monk blocks their way. He identifies himself as a federal agent 
but Hector does not believe him because he doesn't believe anything or anybody anymore. They fight, and while they're fighting, Fran takes the uh, protection club, hobbles around the car, and brains the monk with it. Now the monk is out cold. Fran urges Hector to just you know, go on on foot, to just 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 walk. Hector disagrees, drags the monk into the car, slams the door, tells Fran to get in. In the gun room, the sheriff calls Mr. Guerrero on a miraculously working landline phone and tells him to leave and never show his face in these parts again. After that, he opens up a drawer, takes out a remote control and presses a button. And in the next scene, next text shot, Hector and Fran's car on the road explodes. Tiberius bursts into Yolanda's room, sees Julius on the floor dead, sees Yolanda and sees Pines, and levels an accusation at Yolanda, saying she is not who she says she is. But now the sheriff walks in with a raised shotgun. Tiberius and sheriff fight. The sheriff shoots Tiberius. Now Yolanda turns around and sees that Pines has her gun, Yolanda's gun, the original gun, in her hand, pointing it at her. And Pines asks Yolanda if she is really Yolanda. And Yolanda says no. She is really an agent hired by Rafter Technologies initially to intimidate Augustus Rafter into coming to his senses. And now that he is dead, she was asked to observe and not interfere. Between them the sheriff and Pines disarm Yolanda and the sheriff puts handcuffs on her. And between them they drag her downstairs to the gun room. Now as the sheriff keeps shuttling between the gun room and other rooms dragging in fresh corpses, Julius and Tiberius, Pines explains to Yolanda that she, Pines, is the chemistry teacher. She's no longer fat, she's got her voice back, and she has dyed her hair and eyebrows dark. She married Julius in order to get close to the family, to be better positioned, poised for revenge. And uh, the sheriff is, of course, Jack. And then Pines shares with Yolanda her take of the events. Now, Jack had a car accident after which he uh, had plastic surgery, after which he lost a lot of weight, after which he dyed his hair and eyebrows blonde. Jack did get elected sheriff under the name of Christopher Doyle. Jack met Yolanda six months ago when she was working on intimidating Augustus Rafter. So whatever relationship there is between them, it's all business on Jack's part. It was Jack who disabled the tower. Jack hired an actor to pose as the lawyer Mr. Guerrero. Jack cut Titian's throat. Pines poisoned Rowan. Pines shot Julius. Jack blew up Marcus's car and then Hector and Fran's car. Now, of course, Jack and Pines will get all the money. The old man in the chair is Augustus Rafter. And Pines, aka the chemistry teacher, has been waiting for this for years. She wants to look the man in the eye. She wants to put some questions to the man who thought he'd ruined her life. Now, Jack comes back into the room, opens a secret cache, draws out a laptop which is connected through cable to the internet. He is about to use the bank codes which he earlier obtained from Augustus Rafter, the old man in the chair. But now Jack has something to reveal. The woman who is bound and gagged sitting in the chair, the woman from the opening scene, from the, from the prologue, is Janice Rafter. She is plan B. Now Pines asks Jack to wait a little bit. She wants to take it out on Augustus Rafter, the old man in the chair. But Jack points out that the old man in the chair is dead of a heart attack about an hour ago. Pines is disappointed, but now the sheriff has to disappoint her even further as he says that he does not have any legal rights here. He can't open up an offshore account in his own name and then transfer the funds to it and then safely withdraw the funds in cash using his own ID because he's not really Jack Rafter. He is Jack Rafter's cousin. They share DNA. They knew each other. Then about six months ago, Jack Rafter perished, drowned in a lake possibly with some help from the sheriff. So now they have to turn to plan B, since neither Jack, Yolanda, or Pines is a rafter. The only person who can do any transferring of funds is Janice. That's why she's plan B. Now Pines is shocked, and she raises her gun 
and points it at the sheriff and asks him what his plans are regarding her. And the sheriff is a little surprised by this. He says, look, honey, uh, when you got out of prison and I met you there and I told you I was Jack, you believed what you wanted to believe. And Pines goes, so what do we do now? And the sheriff, who is once again surprised, goes, uh, what do you mean, what do we do? Uh, I do love you, you know. At which point, there comes this voice. Hello? Is anyone here? It is Marcus, navigating the bowels of the house, looking for survivors, with a shotgun in his hand. The sheriff shouts back, directing Marcus down to the gun room. And then he makes a little speech. The dumber they are, the longer they last. Now here's the greatest mystery of all, the thought patterns of a dumb fuck. No matter how carefully you plan, no matter how meticulously you go e over every precious detail, you can never predict what the dumb fuck will do next, unless you're a dumb fuck yourself. The dumb fucks who can't predict it become either ridiculously popular politicians or scandalously successful businessmen. Small wonder then that dumb fucks always occupy the vast majority of key positions in society. The political history of the world is the history of dumb fucks dealing with each other. Now during this, Landa, since everybody's attention is suddenly not focused on her, lifts her foot and from the strap of her shoe she takes out this pin with which she proceeds to pick the cuffs. Now Marcus walks in and even though he's not very bright, he is able to size up the situation. Just out of curiosity, the sheriff asks Marcus how did he survive the car bomb. And Marcus explains that he stepped aside to take a piss and then started the engine with the remote. So shots are exchanged. The sheriff misses. Marcus hits the target. The sheriff falls down on his back. And then Yolanda grabs Pine's wrist. And the two of them struggle, wrestling each other for the gun. Uh, the gun is going all over the place. And Marcus is trying to duck. And the gun goes off, and Marcus is hit in the temple and falls dead. And then Yolanda rings Pine's neck. And then she picks up the gun, goes over to the sheriff, at which point he dies. Now Yolanda frees Janice Rafter, and together they begin the journey through the rain, in the early hours of the morning, into town, into Mr. Guerrero's office. Yolanda shoots the lock, they enter. And then Yolanda calls the state police. Now the next penultimate scene takes place in uh, Janice Rafter's office in Rafter Technologies. She writes Yolanda a check thanking the agent for her services and says that she would like to keep her on a permanent basis but unfortunately there are budget problems now and she as the CEO, president and uh, majority owner of the company cannot afford Yolanda's services anymore. So Yolanda accepts the check and leaves. In the next and final scene, Janice Rafter interviews two new candidates for executive positions in her company. She asks them some very interesting questions, establishes that they are not very bright, and very promptly hires them. So you come to the desert and your mind is blank, and it's a hundred and five in the shade. Now that you've rediscovered your accountable self, there are choices and plans to be made. For the really important things, really grateful you should be. For the campfire and the roadside shack. And the flask in your pocket and the hope in your heart. And the good Lord watching your back.